Welcome into the KSO Show. I am Mason Voth, joined by Derek Young of K-State Online. You can find all of the great KSO content that you want over at On3, and uh, that's the best place for you to stay in the know with recruiting and anything else happening with K-State Athletics. Obviously, basketball in the middle of their season right now, preparing for a uh, former Big 12, Big 8 opponent on Sunday in Manhattan in Nebraska. And football, obviously, will have a busy weekend with visitors in tow and everything. So if you want to uh, have any idea of what's going on there and how the Cats are trying to replenish their roster, a great place for you is K-State Online. If you aren't already there, and if you are, then obviously you know all of those things. You're like, just move on with it and, and get to what you're going to talk about today. That would be the K-State basketball team, which all of a sudden has started to piece things together. We now know what this roster is going to look like the rest of the way. Uh, that has become clear because uh, the first topic of business, and really it's just kind of a footnote and everything because everything else about the situation has been hashed out. But Naquan Tomlin is officially transferring to Memphis, so he very quickly found a new home uh, less than a week after the dismissal came about. So he will play for Penny Hardaway in Memphis this year. The, the Tigers have some nice wins on their resume already this season. Um, they were a, a, a team in the NCAA tournament last year that – they lost to Florida Atlantic in the first round in that 8-9 game. And you look around the American Athletic Conference, Florida Atlantic is in that league this year. Uh, but outside of that, there's really not a, a ton of things that would make you think that Memphis isn't going to be the top dog or one of them uh, in that league when all is said and done. So Naquan Tomlin gives them a pretty significant boost, and uh, he's immediately going to go on to that roster and probably – pay dividends once he hits the floor because they already have some guys that are providing impressive performances. Uh, they also already have guys that are are transfers from higher levels. I mean, J Javon Quinterly, who was at Alabama last year uh, over the last three years and has averaged double figures in his career, he's at Memphis putting up 13 a game. So uh, Penny Hardaway got a good one in Naquan Tomlin if and when they can get him on the floor. <laughs> yeah. College basketball is weird, man. You're going to get a new player. <laughs> there, part of me wonders how this is practical or realistic, but I think it was tweeted by John Rothstein already that Naquan Tomlin could play as soon as this Saturday against Clemson. Now, well, I figured, I, I figured I he guess would have the first semester roll. will end. Yeah, I, I guess with the semester over, I just – thought the second semester would have had to start before he's able to play. No, it doesn't. And I only know this because Javon Thomas, the the very infamous Javon Thomas, he made his uh, debut uh, prior to the second semester starting at K-State uh, when he played his first game in a random game that was played in Brooklyn, New York against Tulane of all teams. So, uh, I think it's just the first semester has to end, and if you're enrolled and good to go, uh, you're good. So I, it does not surprise me that there is an avenue that Naquan Tomlin can play this weekend if they want him to. Uh, so I'll, I'll be fascinated to watch and see how it works out. Look, I I said it on Twitter, and some people are like, oh, come on, whatever. I, 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 I wish the best for Naquan Tomlin and you know getting things figured out with his life because obviously – uh, there have been some struggles here and then on the court, like I hope that he can overcome what I think of as a pretty weak coach in Penny Hardaway uh, and just a, a master class of disasters and distractions that he's put on at Memphis. He's still gotten somewhat of results, but there's always been more talent than uh, actual success down there. So best of luck to Naquan uh, dealing with uh, whatever it's like to have Penny Hardaway and the Memphis show going on. But uh, notable news, to say the least, that Naquan Tomlin has moved on from the team and he's got his new home, and now we'll see what comes about that. Now, what that means for this current K-State basketball team is, as they are currently constructed, we know what they are now. The only thing that will change is that Quez Glover will get back into the rotation at some point. And I guess while we're on the, the topic, I mean, we haven't really heard – Quest Glover's name mentioned in a while. Do, when do you still anticipate Quest Glover to be back on the court for K-State? Yeah, the word has always been pretty soon after Christmas. So I, I don't think we're going to see him against Nebraska or Wichita State. Um, and those are the final games before Christmas, I believe. Yeah. 
And then the first game after Christmas is that is that just Chicago State? Yep. So, and that would be the final one before a tune-up. It would almost be the tune-up, right? The final one before yep. Big Twelve play starts against UCF. So, I wonder if they're targeting the Chicago State game, but we'll see. That'd be a good one to ease yourself into, uh, because as most people that are aware of college basketball, um, Chicago State is terrible. Um, they are not good at all. Um, they are three and nine this season, though. So shout out to them. They've got wins over actual uh, Division One teams in Morgan State and Stetson. Uh, so props to uh, the Panthers on that. But that would make the most sense. You ease a guy in, uh, see how he fits. Then obviously UCF, they've played better than I think some maybe would have expected to start this year. But once they get into Big Twelve play, it might catch up to them. Um, that's also a, a nice conference game to ease the Quest Glover into. And, I mean, then it's West Virginia, and I know it's a road game, and West Virginia might be semi-constructed differently. I know that the NCAA ruling today that is now immediately allowing uh, players that were ineligible because of a two-time transfer, now they can apparently play because of a West Virginia judge granted a TRO uh, to allow them to go for 14 days, and the NCAA basically just threw their hands in the air and said, all right, fine, whatever, screw our rules. Uh, you guys can play immediately no matter how many times you've transferred. So that means a guy like Raekwon Battle is probably going to be on the floor when K-State faces West Virginia in a couple weeks, which has not been the case to the start of this really disastrous year for West Virginia. Yeah, and people are going after the NCAA for for the – I don't even blame them. Like, look – it's not worth they're it at not, this point. They're not able to enforce their own rules how, because they're considered unconstitutional. And they're unconstitutional because the courts are ruling in favor of athletes' rights and because the rules aren't collectively bargained. The players aren't having a say in the rules. Now, if, they, if these were the rules and the players had a say in what the rules were, it wouldn't be unconstitutional. That's the quick and short way to put it. So... I just, I guess I don't know how that's the NCAA's fault. So I laugh at anyone that keep, continues to blame the NCAA at this point. I, I, yeah. There was a time where I was like, the NCAA is stupid. It probably still is. Like, it's their fault that they got here in the first place because they weren't proactive or had the foresight to understand what was coming down the road. They are not innocent by any means, but their latest and, and recent, you know, responses to these court rulings are almost out of their hands because they did the same thing with name, image, and likeness. They're like, oh, whatever. And had they put guardrails on NIL, they would have got sued over that and they would would have went away too. They tried to put a guardrail on the transfer thing. It says, okay, fine, mm -hmm. we'll let you do it without penalty, but only once. And that still got challenged, right? Everything they do gets challenged. Yeah, it, it's fascinating, and it's changing from day to day. Uh, Ross Dellinger had the first report. He's backed that up now and has said that uh, the NCAA has announced that it will comply with the court's ruling uh, over the 14-day period, which will end on December 27th. It's not a permanent change to the transfer policy uh, and says that it's only applicable for the 14-day period and does not forecast for future seasons. But we will see what happens because – the way the news originally came out, it seemed like those guys would be immediately allowed to play, and then it's just done for. It still wouldn't shock me if we get there, like what you're saying, where the NCAA, they had they just in a Richard Linton-esque screw-up in how they handled the portal and NIL and all this other stuff. It has led to them being powerless now in a lot of these situations, and so – whatever like shred of control they think they have over their product, it gets torn up at every other term because somebody turns around and takes it to a judge and like, well, this isn't constitutional. So see, I'm doing this. Or you get a guy like a judge in the state of West Virginia where their basketball team, the one thing that they have in life to look forward to is terrible this year because they had a coach that couldn't get himself any help and stay out of trouble. And it led to a bunch of transfers in and out. And they weren't eligible because those guys had already transferred in and out of other places. And so he's like, yeah, let these guys play. Let, let my boys play ball this year. Uh, so I think that's what you know we're, we're at right now. And I wouldn't be shocked if this becomes 
a permanent long-term change, but at least for the time being, it's only 14 days now, apparently. But the news is going to keep coming fast and furious. You said 14 days. So does that mean Raekwon Battle can only play for 14 days, or are they good for the season? Yes. uh, uh, (laughs) Apparently, he can only play for 14 days currently. And then as the NCAA, I guess, is trying to act like this is going to work, he will only play for this two-week stretch of non-conference games, most of which do not matter. Uh, because most of these teams are playing scrubs over the Christmas break. And then it's, you know, off from there. And the NCAA is just assuming that he's not going to uh, to be out there anymore. It is a wild thing. <laughs> and obviously, uh, detail details will continue to come out over the next day and however long. And we'll see how it all plays out. But it's this is another moment where, yeah, the NCAA... You can bemoan them earlier in the process. This one, they can't really do much about. So whatever the outcome ends up being, I won't blame them. Uh, But based on the current interpreted rules, uh, Raekwon Battle and anybody else uh, at West Virginia, they are eligible to face Radford uh, a week from today, Massachusetts this weekend, and then Toledo uh, two, two weeks or no, a week from Saturday. So those are the three games, UMass, Radford, Toledo. That's big news for Frank Martin's squad that they won't have to face uh, Raekwon Battle and some of these others. Now, if the NCAA gets their way here, and it truly is only for the 14-day period they're uh, eligible, get ready to smile, D.Y. West Virginia, when they face Ohio State, will be without their complete roster again. They will be back to the uh, poor product that has been on the floor to start this season uh, where West Virginia sits at four and five. So. Get excited. Uh, you know, you mentioned Javon Thomas earlier in the show. The speaking, of former, speaking of former Kansas State players, Davion Bradford has been dismissed by New Mexico State. What? But, but lucky for him, there is this new transfer rule, so maybe he can go start playing ball for hey. somebody tomorrow. You know what? The Cats need a big, and they've got a roster spot open. Reunion? I don't do the cats need a big. I think they need a guard. <laughs> they need a Naquan. <laughs> you don't think Davion Bradford can be a Naquan? No, no, I don't. Um, however, part of the rules too, if assuming Davion Bradford has played a game this year, and I assume yeah. he has, he can't play for another team. So. Wild. Uh that's your that's your news of the day, kind of connected to trying to just make an overall point about K State's schedule. Uh, again. It, they ease themselves into Big 12 play this year as much as you can because the first three games are against teams that, as currently stands, you would probably expect them to finish in the bottom third or worse in the league, uh, that being UCF, West Virginia, and Texas Tech. And four of the first five, you can throw Oklahoma State in there at home. So it's not the the toughest stretch to start the year uh, as some in the past have been. I mean, if you think of back to the year K-State won the Big 12 title when the first three games of the, the conference season were uh, Texas, Texas Tech, and West Virginia, I believe. That's that's not a stretch given the time period that you wanted to face those teams to start. Uh, typically, you're like, can you give me OU or Oklahoma State or TCU to start off with? Um, so it's not that tough, and that's why – Makes sense if Quest Glover's back for Chicago State, and then he's got some other games there that aren't the uh, the most significant. But overall now, K-State without Quest Glover is starting to find themselves and come through. Not just, hey, they're finding ways to scratch and win games against Oral Roberts and North Alabama, but the Villanova win was impressive. The LSU win, obviously, I, that might be their most impressive win of the season considering the circumstances of everything. Uh, just a sleepy Saturday road trip to Baton Rouge, not a strong basketball team. You have all the off-court distractions, and you go down and take care of business by 15 points. That was impressive. This K-State team, as they are currently playing and constructed, uh, what do you make of them? They're better than a bubble team. If if what we saw against Villanova and LSU is right, because I – look – you know, Villanova has their warts too. Well, I get it, but that's a pretty solid team. And I don't think that Kent State lucked out because Villanova had a bad night. I thought Villanova played pretty up to their yeah. level of play and Kansas State prevailed anyways. That was, we'll put it this way, and it's an easy way to kind of qualify what those two wins are. Not even close 
that was the best week of the Kansas State season. Not even close. And they did it at a time where they had the most tumult to deal mm-hmm. with. So I think that's impressive. It also shows me that that's probably not even close to how good they can be. So I, I'm not jumping on the bandwagon and say this team's on, going to be on the doorstep of a Final Four like they were last year. But this team is a lot better than we thought a couple of weeks ago. Um, consistency will remain a, a topic to see if they can maintain that level of play. We'll see what happens when they have to integrate Quez Glover. And we'll see what they're made of when they go through the, the, the gauntlet that is the Big 12. But for me, this isn't the, what some fans, I think, latched on to probably a little too quickly, that an 11-12 seed that was hoping to be on the right side of the bubble. Um, the, maybe at one point they were an eyelash away from that. It felt like that when you know they barely escaped North Alabama. Trust me, I get it. But now with things trending in the right direction, I kind of like, and plus, we're, we've we saw things in the in this last weekend, two weeks, for me, that kind of makes me think that this thing is starting to head in the right direction. And some of the stuff is just hard to put into words because you kind of just have to see it and feel it. But like, this felt like a team that was pretty clunky and um, didn't have a whole lot of rhythm at times, and there didn't seem to be a connection. And this, I know this sounds weird between the students and the fan base in this team like there was last year. Now, obviously, that developed over time, too, so maybe we just expected that to happen overnight. But in the last week or two, and probably some of this is thanks to President Linton one way or yeah, another, yeah. this team and this fan base and students you know, body have kind of come together the way that last year did as well. And I think that means something. And I also think – Drum Tang uses this a lot, and I know it's hard to put into words, but like they didn't feel like a team in the first few weeks of the season. It just feel like a lot of singular parts that were still trained to find their way. In the last week or two, I can see more leadership that's being very apparent, and I can see his team really growing together and starting to love to play with one another and be around each other. And I think that can go a long way as well. And and I know that. We need to see him be more consistent from the three-point line. But one of the I, – I, I wouldn't even call him a glue guy because he's a, he's a pivotal player for this team. So I'm trying to find the right way to describe him. But I don't think there's been a more important player, even if he's hasn't got his three-point shot to fall like he typically does, than Tyler Perry in the last two weeks. Yeah, look, I, I, I think there's just a collection of guys that are starting to – play and put themselves in better positions. I think some of them are only going to get better. I mean, Tyler Perry's the one you you mentioned there. I I think he's playing well and finding ways outside of when the shots aren't going to, to do things that help them. Obviously drum tang has talked about being pleased with them. Um, But like Arthur Kaluma is the guy to me that that, that performance, like if he keeps that up and he can keep that aggressiveness and they can keep feeding him the ball. I mean, he's legitimately going to put himself in position to be an all big 12 guy. And a dude that can actually just take over and go be the dude for you in games, go find a basket because uh, he showed it in the Villanova game. And then it was efficient and strong and like what, 17 points he had against LSU. So Arthur Kaluma has been a, a revelation over probably the last three or four weeks with the way he's played. Yeah. And I think I've written this a couple of times, maybe said it on the, this show or, or three mile before too. Something that we're not taking lightly or not probably emphasizing enough and overlooking and maybe underestimating is that last year's team, for the most let's let's be honest, last year's team had two guys that could get 20 points on any given night. And that was Marquise Noel and mm-hmm. Keontae Johnson. Now and Desi, Desi Sills against Kansas. Yeah. Now Desi Sills and Aquan Tomlin could do it, but it wasn't like on any given night that those guys yeah. were to go out and get 20. This team has three. Like Cam Carter can get 20 on any given night. In the first Arthur, half. Yeah. Arthur Kaluma can get 20 on any given night. I know people want more out of him. And they're going to get it eventually. He's going to get hot. But Tyler Perry can still – look, he's still almost scoring 20 points on any given night. Yeah. Despite his shooting. And what I love about the Tyler Perry thing is his shot's not falling as well as they'd like. 
But like, and but he had two the two clutch ones. He had the clutch one against North Alabama, the clutch one against Villanova, uh, in terms of buzzer beaters. But like he had the steal. I think was it against Oral Roberts at yep. the end of the game, where he, he, people have complained about this dude's defense. He had to steal against Oral Roberts at the end of the game for the overtime win, and then the Villanova what they're down four. And they're no. about to turn the ball over, and that yeah. dude's diving on the floor. Somehow grabs the loose ball. It was one on three in the loose ball, I think. He gets Villanova. Still grabs it, throws it, gets an easy bucket to yeah. two-point game. So some of his better plays have not even – like people are going to remember the shots, but they're not going to remember those two plays right there. But another guy that can get 20 on any given night. Do you think there's a lot of teams in the country? Like I know Duke, you know, teams like that, yes. But is there a lot of teams in the country – some of those so there's top 10 teams right now. I don't think of three guys that can get you 20 points on almost any night. Yeah. I mean, I it's certainly teams on like K state's level, probably not. And then you look around elsewhere and you, you say, no, I don't think so. I mean, it, it's, it's helpful. And we talked about this going into the season. It felt like this K state team, obviously high end, they're not going to have the same caliber of players as last last year, but it does seem like the depth would be better. Now, that has changed a little bit with no Naquan Tomlin and then missing Quez Glover for a, an extended period of time. But there is still like a greater depth of this guy can step up for you. And some of it is guys that were on the team last year that can provide more for you like Cam Carter. Um, so I, I think this is a, a good spot for them right now. We were going to do this on the Sunday show. This was fans' idea, and I forgot to do it. Uh, so we'll probably talk about it again on Sunday. But I'll pose this question to you. How deep down the roster do you have to go in terms of total players until you get to where this team, this year's team is better than last year's? Like if obviously the top two teams, the top two players on this team versus last year's, you take last year's team. Top three, I'm probably still going to take Marquise, Keontae, and Desi over whatever combo of three you want to give this year. But once you get past that, you, you start to have some serious thoughts that this year's team could be deeper with that. And, I, I mean, if you want to tell me I'm wrong and you'd rather have a top three from this year's team versus last year's top three, I'm, I'm not opposed to hearing that. No, just because Marquise Noel and Keontae Johnson are all Americans. I don't think there's an all-American on this team. So, no. But I will say the third best player on this team is better than the third best player in last year's team. Yeah. If I asked you right now, could you tell me who the third best player is on this team? Or is it too muddied with the guys at the top sure. just being too similar in their play? Because I I mean, I think right now, if you ask a lot of people, they would be pretty confident saying that Arthur Kalumba is the best player on the team. See, and and I think most people would just say Tyler Perry's the third best. But Perry's what he has done and what he and what I think the how big of a role. He has played and these guys coming together, which I think has been a big part of the success too. I don't think he is. And I think Cam Carter's ascent to being what he is is also a difference maker. So I might say it's Kaluma, to be honest, because I maybe I'm going by importance, but I think Perry and Carter I would take. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Just kind of an interesting thought. We'll uh, we'll dive deeper into it on Sunday and go over everything after K-State faces Nebraska and everything else. Um, but like K State is in a good spot right now with those guys. And um, obviously, then you have a dude like Will McNair that is stepping up and is giving you some impressive minutes. Uh, K State currently 44th in Ken Palm. They've made a big jump. They've moved up quite a bit in the net, which only considers factors from this year. So uh, the net is a little fraudulent very early on in the season, uh, but the movement is still good to see. And I'm sure K State, when it's all said and done, will be higher. Joe Lenardi's recent bracketology, uh, if you remember back to the the old days on the game with me, we referred to him as Joe Loon Uh, but we still respect the art of bracketology and everybody still uh, gets you know in a tizzy about it. He has K-State as a nine seed currently. Uh, it would be facing eight seed Miami, so a little rematch with the Hurricanes. Uh, when all is said and done by the end of the season, do you think K-State is higher than a nine seed or lower? I'm feeling good about them. I'm going higher. It, would you put like a number on it right now? Like just based off of what you've seen this team be, like you've seen enough college basketball to know, like last year's team, they played like 
yeah, that's a that team is a three seed at the least. They could have been a two last year, and you wouldn't have had an issue with it. You've also seen teams at K State like the first four team. You're like, yeah, this team was an 11 seed bubble team, like not much more than that. Where would you put the ceiling on the seed line for this K State team right now? The ceiling, I mean, it's tough because it depends what they do against that Big 12 schedule. Like, you sure, you, you felt like you're maybe adding some teams that would lighten it a little bit to where you're not playing our quad one game every night. But I don't think that's what happened because freaking BYU's in the top 10. Houston's number one. Like, yeah, I don't buy the BYU thing all the way yet, but. Yeah, I, I'm just saying. Like right yeah. now, they're what they were. They're number seven in the Kim Bomb or something like mm-hmm. that. This is. Uh, I mean, I'll go like five, but okay. realistically, if you told me what I think they end up as, like a six or a seven. Yeah, I was gonna. I, I think six is probably the ceiling for what this team ends up being. I would say right now, the way that this team is kind of going along. They feel they feel like a seven, probably a, a team that is in that seven ten game. Um, but I, again, I'm also not just going to completely write off that this team is, is in the NCAA tournament. I mean, it, are you to that stage where you think this is a, a tournament team, no matter what? Like, obviously, they have to come through and they can't lose every Big Twelve game. Then we know they're not a tournament team. But are are you even having thoughts of like NIT or just missing the NCAA tournament and everything altogether still or? Is that out the window? To me, I I haven't even considered them missing the NCAA tournament, so I'm not there now. I mean that 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 schedule might be so tough that I mean you you could be a good team and go six and twelve against the Big Twelve schedule. Yeah. So that's the rough part, but I don't foresee it. Yeah, I mean I'm looking at the schedule right now for K State. I'm I see one. I see only like four games that I look at and say, I don't think they have a chance of winning those. Um, And then, so then that leaves you 14 other games to pick from. And right. But then how many can you look at and say, Oh, that's easy. That's a, that's a lock win. uh, UCF at home. I would say Oklahoma state at home. Yep. But, Um, But no, but no road game, no road game. Um, I would say, uh, I it's tough. I I would like to say on the road at Cincinnati, just because uh, over the last however many years uh, that I've been in Wichita, I've seen a lot of Cincinnati basketball, and they just do not live up to it. Um, but they are eight and one right now. They're twenty six in Kimpom. They just haven't played anybody. Um, they lost to Xavier over the weekend. Xavier is not very good this year. Um, so I mean, Xavier's five and five. And then if you look around at what else they've done, it's not very impressive. So I would say that road game at Cincinnati, um, but it's tough. I mean, and I would still think that BYU probably ends up in that category because I just, I'm not buying them yet. Um, but who knows? And, and Oklahoma's playing good basketball right now too. So I think that's the, that is the one tricky part about the way the rest of the year looks for K-State now is a lot of those games that you would have chalked up as if not guaranteed wins, pretty much it's going to be hard to lose those games at home. Now all of a sudden it's out the window because Oklahoma is a top 25 team with a win against Arkansas uh, this past weekend. And then obviously BYU elevated themselves near the top 10 already this season. So they're much better than anticipated. Uh, even though I do think like there's still room for these teams to fall flat on their faces and, and go to what we expected once they get into Big 12 play. But as of now, the schedule has gotten tougher for K-State as opposed to easier. Yeah, what I will say is, and KU fans will laugh at this, but K State has one of the better home court advantages in the entire conference. Like we saw that in full force against Villanova. It's probably going to look like that for nearly every Big 12 game. Um, maybe even a little bit more. I don't know. Yeah. That was a legitimate crowd, um, noise factor, student factor, and everything. And man, when you got it, when you got it a place on fire like that, it's tough. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I'd I'd have to check um, the start date and everything, but I think K-State might only play one game in Big 12 play at home um, when 
like class is not in session. Say UCF. Um, let's see the yeah yeah. So the first day of the spring semester is January sixteenth, which is the day of the Baylor game. So the first day that students are back in Manhattan, it will be when K State faces Baylor. So the only game you won't have possibly a full crowd for is UCF, and even that like. If this team wins their next three games and they're sitting at what would that put them at eleven and two uh, at the end of non-com play? It's be a good I am, crowd. Remember, because last year they played Oklahoma State when the students weren't supposed to be yeah, back, and, and it was yeah, back. Was yeah, yeah, and that was like I, a that was that was a weeknight game too. I think right. I believe. I believe. Yeah, yeah uh, that it was just like this weekend. I mean, it's, technically, it's already a sellout, but the students won't be there in session when they host Nebraska on Sunday, but I still expect that to be a pretty large crowd. Yeah. Nope. It's, it'll be interesting to, to kind of follow and, and see what happens next. So uh, that is where K-State stands currently right now on the basketball front. We'll see what happens. Um, uh, we may, as we get closer to big 12 play starting and we have time to kill uh, over like the holidays and before big 12 play dive a little deeper into it, but uh, K-State, K-State is in the same mix of all these other teams where I think at one point this year, there were probably a lot of other teams in the league that were looking at their schedule, and or at least their fans were, and saying, that's a guaranteed win. Now when K-State's on your schedule, you're not thinking that right now based on the way they're playing. And you could probably anticipate that K-State gets better from the version they're playing as this past week. Yeah, so a lot of good things to come. I didn't even mention the, the – Probably the biggest crowd in the next month they might have is the one in Kansas City when they play Wichita State. They've already sold like almost twenty thousand tickets for that game. Yeah, and that was impressive because they 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 did a good job last year against Nebraska for that game. Yeah, and this will be bigger than that. Like because usually they they close off the top at least behind the baskets. Like those are selling. Yeah. Well, uh, we all I know we're all looking forward to that game. Uh, some of us more than others. Uh, and everything else. Yeah, last year they got over 13,000 for the game in T-Mobile Center, which had been the most in a while because those crowds in Wichita and Kansas City had kind of been dwindling. Uh, none of them got to the the 4,000 mark that Wichita State hit against South Dakota State this weekend when they played downtown at Interest Bank Arena. But uh, they had been going down, and now they're all yeah. the way back up. So, And I think Wichita State had to return some tickets for this game in Kansas City. So we're saying it's going to be pushing 20,000. It might be very, very weighted in Kansas State's favor. That's just that's exactly what you love to hear. Uh, Wichita State currently 106th in Ken Palm. Uh, their losses this year have been to Liberty, Missouri, and South Dakota State. So there you um, there you have it. And two good friends going against each other, Paul Mills and uh, Jerome Tang. Very yep. close. Yep. I hope Paul Mills has a terrible evening, and the rest of Shockerland does as well. So. Uh, we'll keep everything monitored and go from there. Boy, this Wichita State, so they play Southern Illinois this weekend at home uh, at Coke Arena. It, keep in mind, Southern Illinois already has a win against Oklahoma State under their belt. If Wichita State doesn't win this weekend, it is going to be one nasty stretch of games for them because before Christmas or before the new year, I guess, because they play K-State on the 21st in Kansas City. And then they turn around nine days later and play KU in Kansas City on the 30th. I mean, I know that I know that the Shockers have been wanting to face these teams and they claim that, you know, which that K-State and KU were dodging them. You're getting your wish right now. And I hope you enjoy the the blessings that get passed on to you this year in Kansas City. I, and I know you're enjoying it, but unfortunately for them, they got what they wished as soon as the yeah. program nosedived. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, they also they start they start conference play this year with a pretty tough stretch. Uh, they get North Texas at home, then the road trip to, to Temple and Philly. It's only tough because of the road trip, but they should win that. But then they come home and they have Memphis. So Naquan Tomlin in Wichita Sunday, January fourteenth, uh, and then they're on the road at Florida Atlantic. So they're probably facing the three best teams in the American in four and their first four games of conference play. So. This is a Wichita State team that is going to be maybe in a, a tricky little spot. Fun for me to think about. Cats are going to have to come through. But before they take on Wichita State and uh, put them in their place, they got to do the same thing to Nebraska this weekend. 
Nebraska, probably not a great team, but they do have some players and the ability to play to a certain level. If they get hot from deep, uh, especially my boy Tamananga, uh, you got to watch out for that. So we'll have the full Nebraska preview for everybody on Friday show to uh, get you ready for the Cats and the Huskers as they reignite their play on the basketball court. And then uh, tomorrow, so Thursday, we will talk all about K-State football, get a little bit more of a preview going for the Pop-Tarts Bowl. That is, I guess it'll be exactly two weeks away uh, on Thursday. So we'll preview that game, what's going on with the football program and everything else right now, and uh, continue on throughout the week. So if you need anything else from K-State Online after you watch this video, the best place for you is to head over to On3. Get signed up if you're not. Become a member, and you can get all the access to K-State Sports that you want and need as the recruiting trail picks up for football as it starts to either heat up with the transfer portal or wind down with the class of 2024 or signing day comes up and then obviously full basketball coverage as well with everything going on. So anything else you need to add before we bolt out of here on this Wednesday? No, just we'll have more content coming, right? So what, what were you going to attack next? Was it uh, something football-related, I think? Yeah, we'll talk football tomorrow, uh, give a little bit more of a preview for the bowl game because uh, I'm sure a lot of people are wondering who's even going to be on the field for that game, what is the uh, roster going to look like and everything else. So, And tomorrow will be exactly two weeks before. Yeah. Uh, this is not to throw D.Y. under the bus. He's a very busy man, but if you just listen to that, you can tell he was checked out for the last two minutes because uh, all those things I had just said. So <laughs> means it's time to end the show. Let the man get to work uh, and crank out whatever else needs to be done to keep everybody satisfied over at K-State Online. So that's where you can find it. Uh, for Derek Young, I'm Mason Voth. Be sure you're subscribed to the K-State Online YouTube channel as well to uh, – just know whenever a show goes up or a commitment video goes because we anticipate more of those coming in the near future as well for K-State. So that will do it for us. Thank you for watching and listening to K-State Online.